Alô, alô, alô. Liebe Gäste, So, thank you very much. Uh, before I commence, I would like to say uh, thank you again to the public. You have been wonderful. And I really thank you for your patience. So, uh, your presence here is really of a, uh, a good, a very good thing for us. And I think it's from there that we got much more energy to uh, go ahead. So since yesterday, we have been talking about uh, the way Cameroonian uh, cultural heritage has been translocated, but also dislocated. And going from the previous panels, you have also learned about different aspects of this question which is really, uh, which is tremendously important. And uh, with the last panel, we would also like to address another aspect of these uh, research questions, or questions that we have not been able until now to answer. And we hope to trigger also more questions in you as you will be going home. And, uh, I would like to introduce my guests who will be discussing these questions with me uh, right now. I will start by uh, Dr. Felicity uh, Bodenstein. She is a lecturer in collection and museum history at the Sorbonne University in Paris since 2019. She was previously a postdoctoral researcher in the translocations research cluster led by Benedict Savoy at the Technische University of Berlin. She is a principal investigator of the Digital Berlin team, and you also have a link at MAC, that is in Hamburg, and currently working on the provenance of the royal treasures in Benin at the Musée Quai Branly, that is in Paris. She's also co -audit, a co-editor of contest, contested holdings, Muslim collections in political, epistemic, and artistic processes of return. That was in 2020. Beck Hamburgs and was guest editor of the Journal for Art Market Studies on Africa Trade, Traffic Collections, Volume 4, 2020. Welcome, Felicity. So our next panelist is uh, Dr. Fiona Zigenthaler. She works at Linden Museum, and Dr. Uh, Zigenthaler is art historian and uh, social anthropologist with specialization in interdisciplinary fields of contemporary African art, performance, and visual culture. Since October 2021, she's the Africa Curator of, at Linden Museum Stuttgart, that's here in Germany. From 2012-2018, she held an assistant professor position at the Institute for Social Anthropology at the University of Basel, and served for many years as senior lecturer following the PhD that is 2012, on imaginaries of Johannesburg, visual arts and special practices in a transformation city. She also coordinated the, NS, uh, the SNF funded uh, research project called Art Articulation, Art and the Formation of Social Space in African Cities. That was between 2015 and 2018. Her postdoctoral research focused on the contemporary art scene of Kampala, that's Uganda. 
She was a board member of the Arts Council of the African Studies Association, and she engages in various interdisciplinary research networks and associations. Dr. Fiona Zigantella. So last but not the least, uh, let me introduce to you Professor Fanso. Professor Fanso, Vejirika Fanso, is Emeritus uh, History Professor at the University of Yaoundé One in Cameroon, where he taught from 1974 to 2011, uh, sorry, when he retired from formal academic routines of, the institu of that institution. During that time, he held many appointments, among them Director of Cultural Heritage in the Cameroonian Ministry of Culture, Rhodes Chair Fellowship in the uh, University of Oxford, Guest Professor in the University of Hamburg, Exchange Professor at the University of Indiana, African Studies Fellowship in the University of Cambridge, Visiting Professor at Green uh, Nell College, uh, Iowa and Fulbright Scholar at Trident College, Charleston. I think if I have to continue, we will not finish. <laughs> so let me just stop here and Professor, please, you have the floor. <laughs> So, as I, like I was saying, uh, since yesterday we have been talking of translocation and also of dislocation. So, with these panelists today and now, we are maybe we are going to try to see anyway how beyond all those difficulties, all those challenges, we can implement a sort of reconnection. So. I would like to uh, give the floor first to uh, Felicity to uh, give us a statement, and then we will move to other panelists, and after that we take some questions, and then we will give the floor to the public. And uh, yes, Felicity, please. Okay, thank you very much for the warm introduction. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's particularly uh, emotional for me to be back here presenting Digital Benin because um, this is the place where it all started. Uh, this was uh, one of the first conversations I had at the Technische Universität when I arrived here in 2017 was with a, a colleague who isn't here today but who was working on the team as well, Anna Luther. And we, you know, I was explaining to her that I have all these um, uh, yes, we were still calling them objects at the time, it's a, a word we try to avoid now, but all of these pieces, these ancestors, these, um, these relics uh, from Benin City that are spread across the world, uh, it's so hard to understand them, so hard to, to, to understand where they are, so hard to explain to my Nigerian colleagues how they can find information about them easily and all of these problems, and she was like, well, yeah, I mean, we can create a database, and I was like, yeah. And it, it seems like a simple idea, and it's a good one, um, but it, it is actually really, really complicated to um, put into place because um, anybody who knows museum data and I mean, uh, all of the team who has worked here on the Atlas know how complex it is and how complex it is to get it. Um, but what we did in the, in the following uh, four years build a project and try and bring together this data. Now, uh, today I'm showing you these rather poor uh, screenshots because uh, uh, I didn't think it would be a problem to have internet. <laughs> um, so, Technische Universität, we had another word for unfähig, but uh, because we did always have internet problems here, so I should have remembered that. Uh, <laughs> but so I would invite you all to go and visit the website on your phones or on your computers. You can even do it now as I'm speaking because I'm really just going to show you these rather nasty slides, <laughs> uh, but uh, which is a pity because it's actually quite nicely interactive. Um, but uh, you'll go see it uh, by yourselves. Um, in this is it's a very important aspect. Um, it's. Uh, 
this relational database, and it's relational in a technical sense, but it's also relational. We wanted to build something that recreates uh, these relations that were broken to 1897 and the punitive expedition, which is also a term I really shouldn't be using anymore, um, and which we stopped using as well on the on the on the website. Um, um, when we started out with this project of bringing together the data, one of our greatest fears, at least one of my greatest fears, and I think it was also a critique that we got for the project at the beginning before it, it really existed, was, you know, you're going to be reproducing all of this museum data. It's coming from 130 years of writing about these objects in European and, and North American museums mainly, um, which you can see on, on the... Oh, I didn't put the map, unfortunately. Um, go have a look at the map. It spreads it out really nicely. I always start with the map because it's what explains this, the problem most clearly. Um, uh, so if we just aggregate data and bring it together, A, it will make it look like, okay, now everything's okay. We've managed to recreate this collection. There was a risk of having this universalist uh, aspect to a project like this, you know, UP, we've, we've made it all better, even though we were fully aware that a lot has been lost, many pieces we won't know where they are, it's impossible to quantify that, it's also very difficult to visualize it, how do we make that clear? And then the other aspect was, well, aren't we then again, you know, reproducing categories, reproducing the same words, etc., cetera, um, that are such uh, a problem, and we've already discussed that question of uh, vocabulary. And we didn't really know when we started how we were going to solve all of that. We just knew it was a big problem, and we, we knew we had to discuss it, and we knew we needed uh, colleagues in our team who would have the, the expertise to do that. So um, one of the first things that happened was a very important conversation in Hamburg with uh, a set of um, people that we invited from Nigeria, from many different um, kinds of stakeholders, from artists to museum uh, professionals, um, to members of the royal court, to community representants, etc. And we sat down and we were like, well, what would you like this to be about if we do build this? What, what should it be about? And of course, I was working on the, more the provenance side and the history of the taking of the pieces, and we were very much, uh, you know, in, enmeshed in the in the colonial story. And the first thing that our interlocutors said to us, well, we don't want it to be about 1897. Um, 1897 is important, and it's the reason they're out there in the world. But we don't want this website to be something that you go to, and that that's the first thing you think of. So this was. Uh, something that was quite complicated, and we ne we negotiated through this. And, and one of the colleagues who was, who came from the Benin Institute for uh, uh, Studies, said, you know, it has to be a living museum. And we were all like, okay, now we have to create a website that is uh, a living museum. So we we set about with that as our kind of uh, as our kind of guiding star. How how can we do that? How can we create a living museum with this, a lot of very poor data, uh, <laughs> to be fair. The, the data sets that we, we've gathered have all of the defects that we've already discussed today during the, during the meeting this morning. Um, I can't speak for very long, and please don't hesitate to cut me short, because I can talk about this project for far too long, so I don't know how, how, how long I have, so don't stop me. Um, but if you, if you want to know more about how it was built and what we were thinking in each of the, in each of the sections, there is a very, um, there's quite a, a detailed documentation part in the, on the website, which you, can, which you can go to, which nobody ever looks at, so I'm, I always talk about that first, so that people know, are aware that it's there. Um, so maybe I will just um, try to, you know, to point out two aspects um, which would have been easier to do with the website again, um, how we tried to go beyond what the data from the museums was giving us, and, and how we came to that, and how the fact of working together collaboratively, even if it's really complicated across uh, between Hamburg and Paris and Nigeria and the United States, how we came to uh, these kind of moments of, oh, maybe we could do this. Um, this is the, the first kind of door that leads you to the catalog, the catalog being 
you know, the heart of the of the affair. It's um, Eoto, which means the foundation, and the foundation was a term that my colleague uh, Elagosa Obabaifo chose to to name this section. Um, and it was quite simply the idea that she had that, well, the words are all wrong. So she was transcribing, um, actually she was transcribing the data from the Lagos National Museum. And um, the Lagos National Museum, what, what irritated her was that she was like, well, it's a Nigerian museum, but they don't know the words in Edo, they're using the wrong words. They do have vernacular terms in their data, but they're, they're wrong, they're spelt wrong, they're not the right terms. And it's something she hadn't even noticed in the, in the European data, because in the European data there quite simply aren't any Edo words at all, or very rarely. I mean, it's, it's, it's a few museums do have some, but it's, it's quite an exception. And so it was the, Niger the Lagos data that irritated her, and she was like, we need to write these again. But we had made the choice to not change the museum data. So the, if you go onto the, into the catalog, um, the data that is provided by the museum is reproduced as is. It was also part of the deal with the museums that allowed us to, to gather this data. So, but what we could do was annotate it through tagging and through linking it to other things. So we decided to link each object to uh, an Edo vernacular term. So Elegosa and Godfrey Ekator, who um, I will let you read their bios and look at the different team members. I can't talk about the whole team. We were 17 people working on this for two years. Um, it's All of this is a, a collaborative process. Um, worked with uh, linguists, they worked with historians in Benin City, and they gathered a lot of, uh, a lot of input on how one might best rename um, at least the categories of objects or things that we're looking at. And so they, they came up with, um, with this classification system that you can look at. It's obviously, of course, again, a classification system, which maybe isn't um, the only way we could have done this, but it allows you at least to access the catalog in a different way and to go through these Edo terms, which I think symbolically is important. Um, also, you can listen to the, again, it's, it's not going to work now, but um, I invite you to, to, to go to the website and to have a look there. So you can listen to the terms, you can listen to how they're pronounced, which for me is, is very helpful uh, always. Um, and so then you, you move to the, to the catalog through this, um, through this uh, way. Um, the, other, uh, the other important um, kind of work of tagging or of, let's say, um, uh, annotating the catalog um, was done um, with in, in consultancy with uh, Chao Tayana Mayana, who is a, a Kenyan a digital historian and who uh, worked with us on all of the vocabulary that you can find in the museum data, the problematic vocabulary. Um, and I would have showed you an example, um, but so uh, she established a kind of um, inventory of terms and expressions and things that we couldn't just leave as is in the data, but that we needed to at least, you know, give warnings or uh, provide uh, ex you know, an explanation, um, explain that these words are there, but that we are there because we're, we're just reproducing the museum data. We also redacted certain terms, which I don't, probably don't need to mention which ones, but um, which were in the, in the museum data so that they would not be um, reproducing, again, a certain form of, of um, epistemic violence. Um, and we did want, um, we did need 1897 to be part of this narrative um, in, in a way that's balancing, balanced out by the rest. So I think the important thing was, and the nice thing about the digital world is that you can balance these things, and I will stop now. Um, uh, just, to, just on this last point, because um, uh, uh, so we decided to call it the British Colonial Military Campaign on Benin. This was something that came to, we came to after a lot of discussion. And as you can see in the, in the museum data that we got, only 1,424 out of the 5,246 objects are clearly indicated as being related to the expedition, either through the presence of a name of the member of the expedition, which we took to be proof of provenance. Not everybody agrees. 
Um, so that's interesting too. <laughs> and so you can see that uh, the, the data that we were getting in terms of provenance is often very, very poor and sketchy. I won't go into any more detail of it. I'll let you have a look at the, at the website yourself and I look forward to any, any questions. So thank you very much, Felicity. You have heard from her the different aspects she raised, uh, how the program started and the challenges and so on and so forth. So uh, I think if you, want to, if you want to move from here before the next day, please don't ask me to summarize. Let me just allow me to go next to uh, Fiona. Please, Fiona. Good day, everybody, and um, thank you for being here. It's been a very interesting conference so far. Um, now, after all what we spoke about in the last uh, hours and days, it's quite special to be here as a curator of a museum. <laughs> um, and I must also say I'm quite, quite new in that position. It's just been one and a half years that I'm Stuttgart now. Before, I was primarily an academic. So uh, looking at this amazing project, which was uh, presented now these days, I found myself sometimes a bit in an envious position uh, because having done research myself for so long, now not as a historian, but as a social anthropologist, I really felt like itchy um, to go a bit more into research because it's indeed a fact, and that's on high irony, because uh, two of the main tasks of a curator or a museum are A, to collect, and B, to do research. They are not the only uh, tasks, but they are two crucial tasks, as defined also by ECOM. And uh, I must be honest, I just now, for today, I just picked these two to talk about, because uh, if I look back on the last one and a half years and I look at my accomplishments, I failed in both tasks. I didn't collect, but I was very engaged in preparing for restitutions or for engaging with communities and requests regarding objects which might be um, subject of restitution discussions. And I didn't make any research myself because I was so busy managing requests, organizing database requests, <laughs> um, preparing, co-preparing restitution processes, engaging in conversations about those, speaking to German publics, uh, responding to worried requests about what's happening now with collections that I didn't find a minute to do research, actually not even to read a book, honestly. Um, and I tended to feel this to be a failure somehow. It was not what I considered to be doing when I enter a position as a curator in a museum. <laughs> but the longer the more I have the feeling that's exactly what must happen now to get things also changed structurally. Um, mainly also when I look now at the results of these um, research projects, I think it's key that stakeholder voices are plural, are multiple, that they come from diverse directions um, with diverse agendas, agendas to deal with. Um, that research is also made uh, from different perspectives in um, diverse groups, and that's also one thing that I really appreciate very much about the project being presented today, that, uh, and yesterday and tomorrow, <laughs> that there are really uh, many voices and perspectives coming together, working on a common aim. And I think this is key for every museum which tries to, and I know the word is very much abused, but to decolonize in some way. And I see a huge potential in that. And I, I remember Nani Snoop sometimes saying that she considers herself primarily as a facilitator. Um, and I think that's very much what many curators nowadays, and especially those of the Africa departments, um, are doing. Um, 
as a social anthropologist, to me also always the direct exchange with people, with different worldviews, with various positionalities and subjectivities were always part of my research. And this is also um, as much contemporary as it actually um, should have been also historically. And I think that's exactly the field that also a curator can occupy nowadays within the museum to be someone who enters um, conversations and mainly is also ready to learn. And um, uh, there was already a lot of mention about the huge gaps in databases, in the knowledge of museums, in the often very monologous um, narrative with which objects uh, objects <laughs> were framed and the histories and the societies connected to them. And I think the only way is exactly to gather such voices. Um, I also, one of the main tools of curators is indeed these databases which we have. And you saw um, um, uh, historically about 16,000 objects in Stuttgart. Meanwhile, it's just about the half for various reasons. Uh, one being also Second World War, which destroyed a lot of the cultural goods. Um, and these databases indeed are very dissatisfying. <laughs> uh, I remember once in the, in the run of the project, I think it was, it was Sebastian Sprute who asked me about whether whether we have Bieri and how many we have in our collections. And I was completely um, quite of, um, overwhelmed by this question because with a database you would expect you can enter a term uh, and then it will spit out the results and with Bieri the result was zero. <laughs> and, uh, even though I never managed to see the entire collection, I might never ever see it, I knew that there are objects which in some way or the other would relate to that term. And um, simply to find out how many of these objects actually are Bieri would require a huge research project with many people uh, engaging in it, people would take, go through actually the, more or less the entire Cameroon collection bit by bit, uh, piece by piece, because there are also not photographs which we could just refer to. There are some historical photographs, but there's not much uh, systematic um, uh, assessment of that. And that's not only the case with Stuttgart, I can say. Stuttgart has a lot to catch up also with regard to the photo archive, you said, but that's indeed a challenge that most museums are facing. And this is exactly this step which would also contribute to the decolonization of museum of the most basic museum structures, actually to use the words that the societies used for their um, um, valuables and their um, subjects. So this is just one of the things I would say, would like to say and think there, there is really a lot of cooperation required with many voices, but in the end at the moment, many museums just have one, when they're lucky they have two Africa curators who actually must deal with objects which were looted by hundreds of soldiers. <laughs> and not only that, we do luckily not only have colonial collections and not only violently plundered uh, uh, collections, although they make a very big part of the collections. But it's indeed uh, something not feasible just for one or two individuals trying to redress uh, the mistakes which were made in the past, but they can only help and support and engage in trying to do that by engaging with colleagues, with uh, community members, with stakeholders, and try to catch up uh, with this research. And this research also, and I think that's also a very important point when you talk about changing the structures of knowledge generation, this must go also beyond uh, doing research just within the museum archives or within the German archives, but also collect histories, narratives, which are existing in the communities uh, whose 
valuables are, or cultural goods are in Germany now. And this is a very much a structural thing which affects everything, not only museum management, but also politics. And there needs to be kind of a concerted um, agency from all to um, participate. And I think um, there are many good signs, uh, also in terms of support from our uh, carriers, our patrons, our sponsors, because the museums can't decide alone on restitutions. That always depends on their sponsors and how their political will. Uh, and I think we're on a very good track, but this can even be um, uh, pushed further. So I think that's for the moment, before it gets too long. <laughs> and we will have time for the discussion later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fiona. She has spoken of a uh, transition from academia to the world of museum and has highlighted the potentials that uh, this world of museum also uh, has for the research in general. Thank you very much. And I think we'll be coming back to some points that you raised. So for now, let, us, uh, let me give the floor to Professor Fanso. Before that, I'd like to remind you that he counts among uh, the first who raised the issue of restitution in Cameroon about the Ngonso, of which we have been spoken all the time. So now we have the opportunity and also, uh, yeah, we have the opportunity to have him here and Prof, I give you the floor. Yeah, I am happy to be here. And I like to start by thanking the great professors, doctors, professors, professors, doctors, uh, Savoa and Guavo, who invited me in the first place and uh, in association with the Cameroon Embassy here. I'm happy to be here because I have learned so much from this issue of restitution. In fact, when I started working on this issue, people were not talking about restitution. I was hoping that as far as Ngodso was concerned, we would try to work with the museum that was housing it so that we could borrow it once in a while uh, and show it to the Nso public during the Ngonso Festival, which we have, I mean, it has been, it has been interrupted recently by the conflict which is going on in Cameroon, uh, particularly in the two English-speaking regions of the country. I, I'm happy to listen to these various aspects of restitution. But the greatest thing about it is that the German authorities have accepted to send back those holdings which have been here uh, for more than a hundred, some, uh, the, 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 the list is 120 years. 100 and between 120 and 140 years, even more, because before German colonization in 1984, when it began, the German traders were on the coast before then, and they were taking some objects uh, out. We now know from yesterday that there are over 40,000 Cameroonian objects in Germany. They would have been more if some were not lost in transit, perhaps if some were not taken away during the war, the Second World War, perhaps if some people who got them privately did not sell them, and whatever. But the important thing about it is that these holdings include sacred 
royal, spiritual, social, economic, and political. Many of these holdings, they possess those powers, economic and political powers, linked to the various traditional communities from which they were looted and taken to this country. It is a wonderful thing because those are the communities that own them, that produce them for various reasons. We heard yesterday, and I think Professor Kuman Jumbe answered emotionally and rightly when people were saying, oh, send them back to the museum, to the country. They were not taken from Yaoundé. They were not taken from the government. They were not taken from the museums. They were taken from communities. In fact, Gonso was taken from so before that group, that ethnic group became part of the German colony. They were taken in 1902. Some were taken before. 19, it is in 1906 that the Nso community was finally defeated in a war that lasted three months, two to three months, before that group was subdued. So those objects which are taken, if you are sending them to Yaoundé, you are sending, they don't mean anything to them. They will just be like they are here. All right. What is the use sending them back if they are going to just remain in the museum? We have not cultivated the tradition of going to watch things in the museum. We, work, we go to communities to see performances where those uh, uh, holdings have a meaning. When you go and see it just standing in the museum, what does that mean? Makes no sense. And so it is a wonderful thing, restitution would lead to repossession, reconnection. You, when you send them back, the people take their holdings back. In my community, we have to, in fact, inf disinfect them by doing rituals that will reinstate them. God saw as it is, cannot just go and we put it in the palace where it was taken or somewhere. It has been contaminated. So we will take time to, re <laughs> to spray. Yes, and that is in taking, doing rituals that remove those things from it before it becomes part of the community. And the good thing is about it is that, you know, when you send back the objects, you liberate yourselves from the curse because it has been for long that people want back their things and you are holding them. Now you want to look very important when you are sending them back. No, yeah. the important people are still those who possess it. One thing is, is that there are some communities, there are some holdings here that the communities do not even know. We were talking yesterday and I think Professor Kuman Dume was saying he was going now to call the people to say that this object or this holding is here. There are communities, you know, these things were happening in a non-literate society where information was transmitted orally. The problem with oral tradition is that it mixes things up. And when those who can transmit the information are no longer on the scene, it is lost. And it becomes like a rumor. And in fact, some communities don't even know that they have holdings here. 
And for me, it is that these things be sent, if they, those communities which do not know, all right, we investigate and make sure that when we send them back to the country, they eventually get to those people so that they deal with them as they used to do with their traditional uh, 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 sacred uh, holdings at the home uh, before they were looted or they were taken out. And in fact, let me not take too much of a time of yourself, but this restitution will help to establish, begin a new relationship between Germany and Cameroon generally and the particular communities. The future of this object will be discussed seriously because in our community, there are communities. We, we have talked about those of you who have been to Fumban and you would know Fumban has a wonderful museum where some of their objects too are kept because from the time the Fumbanese became Muslims totally, their king became Muslim, many of the, thing, of the things were put in the museum, a new tradition which came up, but those things have many only in the community that produced them and not in the museum. But we can see that since they have been here in the museum, the future would be for Germany to help those communities that want to put up their museums to house those holdings when they are brought back, help them, work with them. You can invest in doing that and then train the personnel in the way of protecting them as they were here so that they do not fall apart in the shortest uh, uh, time. So let me, I will answer questions with already. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much, Prof. Maybe I'll just uh, recall some two aspects that you raised. That is uh, restitution as way to reconnection and restitution also as a way of freeing oneself from curse. So that was very important. So now, uh, before we uh, continue, I would like to come back to Felicity. According to this uh, interesting project about the um, Benin bronze, which has also been, which were also taken in colonial context, violent context. I permit myself to say looted, as you also said. So I think you were dealing there with how many objects were you dealing with? Uh, We've identified 5,200. 5,200 objects. objects. And now we are, spoke, we are speaking of 40,000 objects from Cameroon. So I was wondering, can we also implement such a project for Cameroon and maybe make it also visible? Because you also mentioned some difficulties. For 5,000, then I can imagine for 40. How can it look like? Um, I think that would be a lovely idea. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be something, and this morning I was thinking it would be an amazing thing to connect what you found in Germany with what is in France, because it's a colonial history of two nations with Cameroon, and we often discuss them separately, and I think this would be an ideal moment to reconnect also those two <laughs> with, uh, with uh, Cameroon, and I think the, the, the collections can, can help us do that. Um, it is possible. It's not a question of numbers. Um, it's a question of the right um, of the right setup. And right now we're building a prototype that is more user friendly than the the website that we built was built by programmers who are very you know who are 
extremely uh, technically um, performant, but it's very hard to actually add new data in for a person like me right now. So we have to create a new system that is a, a prototype that will allow anybody to really use the, the model to aggregate data from different sources. Okay. So um, yes, I'm very much hoping to do that uh, maybe with the, with the data from Cameron. I've, we've already had a, okay, a let brief me stay discussion with Benedict. Okay, <laughs> let me stay uh, with you and then maybe I'll put a somehow provocative question. Um, you mentioned how it started. I also know that uh, Nigeria was asking for those bronzes since the 1960s uh, and 70s. Even since the 1930s. And was even ready to maybe a collaborative work. At first, Nigeria was not even asking for restitution, but for circulation and collaboration, which was actually denied. So uh, I wonder, is this type of if I could say digital form of restitution, does it entail, uh, let's say, failure of authentic restitution? Um, that is a good question. I don't like to talk about digital restitution. I don't like the term okay. because I don't believe any. I don't believe in it. Okay. <laughs> I think there's physical restitution, and I think we can. We can try to r we can try to return knowledge, uh, like in or uh, the restitution of knowledge project, which I was, uh, which we were writing as well when when I was here at the TU, um, has done. I think the project actually exists because restitution, physical restitution, is happening, and I think the quality of the project was possible because physical restitution was already underway. It was what allowed us to say, okay, um, we have now this perspective that the ancestors are going home. And for my Nigerian colleagues, and in particular in Benin City, that made the relationship between us so much better. You know, It allowed us to work together in a way that I don't believe we would have been able to work together 10 years ago. Okay. Because, and we've seen this through the process of the Benin Dialogue, which existed since 2010. When they met in 2013 in Benin City, there was a major diplomatic crisis because the curators who came from Europe to Benin City were offering to give back data, to give object, uh, to give photos, to give copyright. And the people there were like, yeah, that's nice, but that's not what we want. Okay. Um, and so I think uh, that the two things have to go together. Uh, I think it's with the relationships that we can build through restitution that we can also build better relationships of working together, of sharing knowledge and of, of and for that to be okay because this website right now is still in Hamburg, it's still associated with the Museum of Hamburg, we would like it to be hosted by a Nigerian institution and that will happen at some stage. But what my, co what my colleagues in Benin City gave to us was a lot of information and knowledge which obviously will be shared with the world, but you know, it's, it's still, there's still an asymmetry you know, it was a project paid by Germany, uh, mm. um, piloted from a German institution. It gave a lot of prestige to a lot of German institutions. You know what I mean? It, there's, all, there's still a, a weird flow of, of that's not always going in the right direction. <laughs> um, and it's really hard to avoid that. And I think we need to talk about also the structures of financing and, and, and you know, how, the, how, it, or how it works, who decides uh, how this knowledge gets produced now from now on. So. For me, this project was able to exist in the way that it existed because physical restitution is happening. Okay. Um, and I don't think it, it is no, nothing like a replacement or anything like that. For okay, that. thank <laughs> you very much. Uh, Fiona, before I come back to you, let me uh, stay by the prop. Uh, you just mentioned a restitution as a way of freeing oneself from a sort of curse. Prof, do you uh, feel that German fears the curse? <laughs> well, or Germany, do you really have the feeling? Because these objects have been asking or requesting since years. Maybe, uh, and? Yeah, I think the Germans, if they don't, let, them tell, let me tell them that they should fear the curse. <laughs> They don't know the reason for the, for the wars they have been involved in. 
It may be part of that curse that led to the First World War against Germany, to the Second World War, uh, to the divided country. It may be part of it. So they should fear. If they have not been told, I am telling them. Send them back. <laughs> Send those holdings back so that you don't have another <laughs> another war. <laughs> yeah, uh, it is a, a, a very difficult question because some of the times we don't give importance to things we take from other people, particularly things which are not consumable immediately, and we treat them as objects instead of what they are. As I said, when you treat them as objects, you have contaminated them. Okay. Many of those objects that you have, which for us are not objects, need to be cleansed through rituals in order that they regain the power they had before they were taken away. You see, you brought the, some of them are touched by hands that should not have touched them because there are all, uh, holdings at home, many of them, that only women can touch. There are some that only men can touch. There are some that only the initiated, not all men or not all women, can touch. So if every Tom, Dick, and Harry is passing and touching what was not made for their hands, you take a curse. If it is not affecting you or you don't realize personally that it has affected you, when it is be affecting you, you will not know. Okay, surely. Uh, thank you very much. Let me remain by the case of uh, the Ngonso. In the last report of the campaign, Brimba Ngonso, it is mentioned that uh, the decision of uh, restituting Gonzo was not taken on, let's say, a collaborative uh, basis. So, uh, and the, let's say, the community side was not really happy with the way the decision happened. And because she does not want something which was taken in violent context and which is now given back as if it was a goodwill of this institution. What is your feeling? And according to you, what should have been the best way to really handle that case in the way that uh, all the two sides go on maybe on an equal basis and also a satisfying basis. You know, I said when I was making my introductory remarks that when I became involved with the Godzor issue, I was not thinking then about restitution. I became converted to restitution later because uh, the possibilities were beginning to come up. Rest, the issue of restitution of these holdings, I don't think it started from Gonzo, because it is general now. It is not only Germany that is ready to restitute. To restitute. It, there are other countries, the, the, the British, the French, uh, the, the, the Dutch, and the, that's the whole, uh, when sometimes they call Dutch, it is Dutch land, it is Germany. And sometimes we get confused about that. But I was thinking of saying, 
Well, we will try to convince those people that who are keeping Gonzo, give it back to us once in a while. And then we will send it back to you. Then it became the issue of restitution came up and we said, oh my goodness, we will get back Gonzo. But unlike when we had uh, uh, Foga this uh, afternoon, he says, one professor, a colleague of mine, uh, Professor Changwa, he said, send back Gonzo so that we bury Gonzo. No, I don't be, believe uh, that we should bury Gonzo. Like when you bury Gonzo, you are burying the community. Because Gonzo is the founder, is the female founder of the Zo community. And the effigy represents that founder. Because like some, she was saying, I mean, some people were saying, oh, that must be a color, not basket. Because uh, what you see, the effigy is made in the form of a, almost like a chair and with something like a basket holding. You know, you say, oh, that's a color, not basket. I mean, <laughs> how would you be making, taking time to do all that for a color, not basket, when there are baskets? around. So uh, I think that now we have to see, I don't want the rush of somebody was saying yesterday, why are they still here? They were taken by force. We don't want to take them back by force. Now it is time for collaboration in order that they come back peacefully. Because if another force is used, you destroy the object before they ever get, get back to us. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Fiona, I would say I'm very happy to meet you here again today. Because uh, maybe what you do not know is that we co-curated an exhibition in Hamburg in uh, 2019 in the framework of uh, Dwala Mangabel as uh, resistant, as uh, let's say, a uh, fighter, a resistant of colonialism in Cameroon, and so I'm very happy. I also remember that uh, in the framework of this, uh, of this uh, exhibition, I happened to travel to the Linden Museum in search of Dwala objects, Dwala uh, cultural heritage there. At that time, you were not yet at uh, Linden Museum, Something uh, struck me is that I was not uh, authorized to enter the, the, the storage. And when I was finally, uh, let's say, authorized to enter the storage, I could not stay any longer. And I also, I was called upon to wear gloves, to wear this and that and so to wear masks because of contamination. Toxicity. I don't know. Has the situation improved yet? Um, unfortunately, not. <laughs> and in that sense, uh, the term toxicity was told today already one time in a more uh, metaphoric sense. Uh, indeed, I mean that's that's uh, that's something which has been written already about uh, this kind of double toxicity of many objects. That, on the one hand, toxic in the sense of how many had been acquired, <laughs> um, but also toxic in the sense that, indeed, in the fifties and sixties, most German museums, I think, I think all. And not only German, but I now know from German uh, museums, they, they used chemicals to, to make sure that there are no worms and bugs and uh, other living creatures who would actually attack the, the objects. That in some way it's absurd in their physical integrity. It's to some extent thanks to these toxics that they are still complete. <laughs> But at the same time, and that was actually also mentioned by Mr. Fanso, it, this, this, these toxic chemicals make it impossible actually in terms of, if you want to be on the very safe side for your own health, 
you should be wearing glass, gloves and a mask. And um, <laughs> yeah, that's indeed mainly with organic objects. Okay. And I always use the term object, which is really a deformation professionnelle. It's, um, I'm, I'm learning to change also my vocabulary because it's really not just objects. <laughs> okay. yeah. uh, thank you very much. So, uh, would you allow, uh, so it means that you wouldn't allow me to tell the dweller community to come to you with restitution demands if they want to remain alive. I think I didn't understand your question. <laughs> ah, ah, you mean ah, you mean that the objects are actually a threat uh, to the you no, 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 definitely not. No, uh, um, and I think I'm, I, I act very much also in the spirit of my predecessor that we actually really try to possibilize whatever kinds of visit, especially by the communities or the uh, uh, inheriting. Um, communities, the, the successor communities of those where the objects came from. Um, the truth is that many museums have storage conditions which um, you wish they weren't there <laughs> and which you also don't want to um, kind of uh, I mean, in very few cases, there was access granted to some individuals, uh, and many of them actually decided they would not want to stay there uh, because there's a sexual accumulation of um, objects. Uh, what we do normally is, um, and that always requires a lot of preparation, is to actually find out which which objects, <laughs> which insignia, entities. which entities um, um, the, the asking community is most interested in, and we prepare actually a space for that, also a space where you can breathe <laughs> as far as it is possible, but uh, in, in the case, uh, those who have been at uh, Linden Museum, they know that's a rather old museum, uh, which does not actually have the facilities that a museum nowadays would need, especially when it wants to cater uh, to a diversity of communities who mm. come to see their um, entities. Okay, so uh, it mm. means if the dollar community comes to you, would you be ready maybe to, what are the steps that a community needs to fulfill before maybe it raises a question of restitution or is there any steps that you have already taken towards these uh, aspects which is i mean i think that's that's really a, a question of the direct conversation on what what are the requests how can we help how can we cater how can we support uh, for me personally uh, it doesn't really play a role if someone plans to uh, ask for restitution or not, I will in any case try to provide accessibility okay. so that they, they can really have an encounter with those entities in question. Also accessibility um, to the famous photo archive, which actually there is no accessibility because it, there's, it's not so systemized. We can't even say which kind of photographs exactly are where. Um, and this is um, one of the key points, which is also one of the key requirements actually also today in museums policy is on, on the top of the things, make things accessible, even if it's first through databases, make it accessible so that people even can actually know what a museum has. And as our structures at the moment can do this only to a limited extent, we do it, for instance, with our uh, digital collection. I think it's also important to mention that. We have an online digital collection, but where we don't just, you know, spit out the data which have been in our data uh, um, basis for more than a hundred years, sometimes with very unfitting terminology, but we actually first do research on the objects before putting them online, mm -hmm. which uh, of course slows down the whole process, 
but um, still contributes in small steps to accessibility. But that's actually only the first step. Whoever wants to see objects which are not on this database, and that's actually what I have been very busy with in the last one and a half years, is really try to uh, provide, organize, for a meeting, for a, a joint um, 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 yeah, visiting of these entities. But it is indeed um, uh, something which doesn't really fit yet into um, established structures. And I think there, that's again something where a lot needs to be done in terms of structural changes to make things uh, okay. more easy for these conversations. Yes, more easy, I like the word, because uh, uh, like Erin was saying yesterday, I also have some experience from the Linden Museum and many others also in regards, as regards accessibility, because like she pointed out yesterday, uh, many people also have an agenda they would like to investigate many things and so on and so forth, many entities. But then there is also this aspect. Most of the time you would like to maybe investigate a number of these entities, these uh, heritage, but then maybe you ask for 20 items and only maybe two are available. And so, uh, in the meantime, has there been an improvement of the situation? I can tell you that from the re request which came in during my time, <laughs> 20 <laughs> was the lowest number that we made accessible. Okay. So it was rather more. We can't make really much accessible because we have very limited space. Okay. Um, but uh, anything that is beyond the ex permanent exhibition that we have anyway, I, I try to make as much accessible as possible. But th this, uh, and that many people underestimate, this requires preparation. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it really needs long-term announcements. I think maybe it's the opportunity <laughs> to explain to, to the prepare, public what, yeah. yes, what yes, is... Uh, because it's first about uh, finding uh, what exactly would want to be seen. And uh, and then it needs to we would need to find a date uh, where everyone um, is available and uh, as many people need to travel this is often also an additional uh, thing to to find a date when we are available to find space for our conservators uh, that they have enough time to prepare the the entities properly so that they can also be presented in a in a decent way. Um, so that's that's a, that's a whole process, and normally because there are no photographs, of course, we also try to arrange the, that when we make take the, the the entities out of the storage, that we also just use the chance to take photographs. But this in itself is again a process. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, it's true we started a bit later, and uh, I think for now. We uh, do not have time maybe to take another round of questions from the panelists. If you want to give the public the opportunity to speak. So I would like to invite uh, to next. Um, first of all, <laughs> thank you all for this uh, round for the different questions. <laughs> And uh, I would like to invite uh, the other pa chair. Oh, yes, you can. Thank you, Thank you very much. Yeah.